How many people work out a life plan for themselves or their children, willing to put so much on the line, money, time, energy, to ensure success in the world? Then Jesus passes by and says, Come, follow me. Dear brothers and sisters, Salve Maria. An interesting self-help book that came out recently tells the story of the upbringing of three sisters who later became chess prodigies. It all began in 1965 when a Hungarian man named Laszlo Polgar devised a life plan for his children, Susan, Sophia, and Judith. He and his wife, Clara, would raise them to become internationally acclaimed chess players. To that end, the children would be educated at home, their rooms and the rest of the house filled with chess boards and other chess paraphernalia. The three sisters would compete in the best turn tournaments against the best players. In short, their lives would be dedicated to chess. And sure enough, Laszlo's plan began to pan out. Susan, the eldest, began playing chess when she was four years old, and within six months, she was defeating adults. Sophia, the middle child, did even better. By 14, she was a world champion, and shortly afterward, became a chess grandmaster. But Judith, the youngest, outdid them all. At five, she could beat her father. At 12, she was the youngest player ever listed among the top 100 chess players in the world. And at 15, she became the youngest grandmaster of all time. For 27 years, she was the number one ranked female chess player in the world. Now, it's true that the Polgar sisters' childhood was completely atypical, prioritizing chess above all else. But how many families like them are willing to do the same or want to do the same? They work out a life plan for their children and dedicate their time, effort, and money to ensure they succeed in the world, whether in, in academics, or in arts, or in sports. Then all of a sudden, divine providence throws a monkey wrench in the works. One of the children feels a calling to the religious life. Then what? All hell breaks loose. Up and down history, from St. Francis of Assisi to St. Thomas Aquinas to St. Aloysius Gonzaga, families have moaned and groaned over their children's desire to dedicate themselves to God and the church. And not because they aren't Christian or anything. In most cases, children with a religious vocation come from families who are deeply Catholic, families who go to church on Sunday, families who, who even pray for vocations, but as long as it's not for mine. <laughs> so what is it about the religious life that so many admire at a distance and yet, like the rich man from today's gospel, are so unwilling to commit themselves to. Well, let's take a look at what the gospel tells us and we'll find the answer. The first thing we notice in the opening lines of the story of Jesus and the rich man is how the latter initially seems so full of expectations and good intentions. He approaches Jesus by running towards him, and knelt down before him in expression of reverence that far exceeded the prevailing habits of courtesy of the time. Then he asks Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And when Jesus names off the commandments, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, the young man replies, Teacher, all of these I have observed from my youth. In other words, our Lord wasn't dealing with some Pharisee or a scribe or an adversary. 
but someone who genuinely wanted to seek his advice on how to attain eternal salvation. So why then, when Jesus tells him to go and sell what he has and come and follow him, does the young man withdraw crestfallen, as we hear in the continuation of the gospel? At that statement, his face fell and he went away sad. Well, St. Mark tells us, for he had many possessions. What does it mean to have many possessions? Well, in this case, it literally meant that the rich man was too attached to earthly goods. But for others, to have many possessions might mean being attached to other things, such as fame, or social recognition, or power. And where's the prestige in becoming a priest or a religious brother or sister, especially nowadays? None. Actually, it's quite the contrary. Further on in Mark's account, Jesus tells his followers that no one who has given up family or home or lands for his sake will fail to receive a hundred times more. But he adds, with persecutions. But above all, the greatest inconvenience for most of us is when God gets in the way of our plans, of the life we've envisioned for ourselves or for our children. Going back to the Polgar family, imagine if one day, in the midst of preparing for a chess tournament, our Lord passed by and said to one of the girls, come and follow me. You'd almost be forgiven for thinking that, well, after so much preparation, so much investment, are their plans simply to be tossed away? And that's why so many say, no, Lord, or not now. I'll go to Mass on Sundays. I'll help the poor with alms. I'll even sign up for a prayer group. But giving up all my plans and leaving everything behind to follow God's plan and not mine. No, no way. That's asking for too much. And that's why so many, like the rich young man, prefer their possessions or fame, their life plan, over Jesus. Nevertheless, the ones who say no to Jesus, like this rich man, can keep their possessions, but they'll always, as the gospel says, go away sad. Because we were not created for the goods of this world. We weren't even created for ourselves, but for God and for what He desires of us. So friends, let's ask in today's meditation for this Monday within the eighth week of ordinary time, for the grace to be generous no matter how impossible it may seem. For as Jesus says in the end of today's gospel, for men it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.